So we have with us uh, Susie Snyder, who um, I'm very glad to say I have known since she was the Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And um, she has had a long history of working on nuclear issues. Um, she is currently the president of the International uh, Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which in 2017 won the Nobel Peace Prize. And, and uh, one of her current projects is a work called Don't Bank on the Bomb Research, uh, that is a global report profiling the companies that produce nuclear weapons and the institutions that finance them. And she's finding that millennials in particular are very interested and don't want to invest their money with companies that are invested in, the, in nuclear weapons. And she's always constantly searching for young people, particularly women, to propel into this world because it's an ongoing issue. And next we have Re Rebecca Masterman, who first worked as an undergraduate with the Minnesota B Lab at the University of Minnesota, and then found her passion and later came back. She is now the program director of the B Squad, which is a team that happens to be 15 women and three men. <laughs> so um, we welcome Rebecca today. And she also happens to love yoga and heavy metal music. So that's <laughs> trying to get a little performance in here. But <laughs> and then um, we, together some <laughs> <laughs> we also have Daisy Khan, who is an award-winning speaker, author, activist, commentator, and the founder of Women's Islamic Initiative in Spirituality and Equality the largest global network of wi Muslim women committed to peace building, gender equality, and human dignity. Um, she is also the author of Born With Wings, and her autobiography, which is for sale in the bookstore, and also the editor of this amazing book called Wise Up, which is a knowledge toolkit to end extremism and hate. And she happens to have a few extra copies. It's, it's a great thing to have. Um, but before she began in this particular thing, she was an architect. And um, so I hope she'll be talking a little bit about women in business. She worked for many of the Fortune 500 companies. And so shall we begin with you, Susie? Sure. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, thanks so much for making it out here on this bright Saturday morning. It's <laughs> not quite so bright as we were maybe hoping, but um, maybe our conversation will, will brighten the day for everyone. That's my goal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about women, peace, and security. Um, and you know, let's, let's think for a second about where we are in the world. It's been just over 100 years since women here got the vote. It's been almost 20 years since the United Nations Security Council recognized that conflict, that war, affects women as well as men. <laughs> and affects women perhaps differently than men, and, and recognized that women are not only victims, but women are active participants, both in conflict and in preventing conflict. The Security Council did this through uh, a Security Council resolution, Resolution 1325. And that was a resolution that sort of, all of a sudden, the whole world had to take another look at the way that conflict, the way that war affects women, the way that women are treated during war and the way that we do things after wars. And this is really, really, really important because anytime there's a conflict anywhere in the world, there's this process for how you figure out what to do when the conflict, you sign a truce, peace agreement, you put down the weapons, and you figure out, okay, how we're gonna fix this, how we're gonna rebuild society. And for years, that conversation was a group of men sitting around saying, this is what we're gonna do. But that doesn't consider a lot of people still left. And when you consider gender-based violence, we think gender-based violence means rape often, but when it comes to war, when it comes to modern warfare, gender-based violence means that young men between the ages of 15 and 25 are targeted and are killed because they are young men and it's assumed 
that they are participants in the conflict, whether or not that's true. So we have to look at, when we think about women, peace, and security, when we think about security, we have to look at all of these different questions. And it's not easy. But there's been a lot of really incredible progress in the almost 20 years since we've seen this resolution. Now these disarmament, demobilization, reintegration plans, these post-conflict you know, opportunities, take women into the room, are full participants in the discussion. It means that questions around where are weapons kept, you know, what, how are women who have participated in conflict, who have taken up arms, where do they get to fit back into society? All that is part of the consideration, part of what's being discussed. And that's a new thing. And it's important because it changed the consideration from this, oh, but women never take up arms. Women are peaceful by nature. Uh, which is nice in theory, but actually it's not true. Just because I have two X chromosomes does not make me a more peaceful person. I have been socialized to be able to negotiate. I have, through culture, I have been forced to be hyper vigilant about my surroundings, to be intuitive, to look at things differently in order to protect myself because, well, not me, I'm giant, I'm like six foot two, right? But, um, but a lot of women are physically smaller, so I have to be you know, conscientious and protect themselves. So we're, we're careful about how we negotiate our space, but we're not inherently, we're not genetically more peaceful because we don't have the, the Y chromosome. It's culture that does that. And culture is, is an important consideration when we look at women, peace, and security because it's, it's something that changes all the way around and something that is constantly changing, and we have these generational shifts. In order to build a balance, to build equity, we need to change things in the culture. We need to recognize what is biology and what is culture and what we can do, and we need to build a base of law. So I'll finish on this last note. We have this amazing international set of agreements, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. We call it CEDAW for short. Um, and the United States is actually a participant in the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And it is a tool that women around the world use to ensure that their voices are represented and their rights are fully realized and balanced with those of all of society. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Rebecca. That was amazing. Um, I, I'm going to have a little bit of a different approach because I, I'll be very honest, even though I do lead a team that ended up being 15 women, I, I don't at all focus up on women in what I do, except for the fact that we manage social insects and boy, the females dominate <laughs> that world. And there are so many male jokes that I try to be sensitive about, but sometimes I have to do it. I, I'll, I'll tell you that I was an undergraduate in, um, at the University of Minnesota working in an entomology department for about, a, actually about two years, and it was in that department where I got a job working for Dr. Marla Spivak, who is this, turns out to be brilliant uh, MacArthur genius, and um, she gave me the chance to become a PhD student the day after I graduated from my undergraduate program. And I became a PhD student in a department of entomology. Uh, it turns out I, I absolutely am fascinated with bugs, insects. And in that department, when I reflect back on my experience, about 50% of the women who were leading that department in the role of professor were actually women. And, and so we had amazing women professors, my role models. I had a lot of women role models. And I was very, I think, um, I, I didn't have to even think about the fact that I was a woman in entomology because it was absolutely, it, it, it never came up. And that was in the 90s, so I consider myself pretty lucky. Uh, then when I came back to run this program, uh, it started with, there were a couple of, of people who were working the program, but the program needed a leader, and I had had a, a career in business in between my PhD graduation and returning to the, the B Lab. And I built the program from a couple of part-timers to the, the number of 
18, really by people coming to me and saying, I want to be a part of this. And at one point, Marla said to me, are you trying to just hire women? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and my answer was, no, absolutely not. It's just, it's just that the people who are sending me these heartfelt emails saying, they actually, most of the people that I employ offered to volunteer. And a uh, little bit about the B-Squad, we have three different uh, roles. One is providing extension to beekeepers, to people who are managing honeybees. We're, it's our job to teach them how to do it so that honeybees are as healthy as possible. Also, we're tasked with communicating the latest bee health information to the public, and that's really taking science and translating it so that the public can, can embrace it and then take action. And then, then we have this really creative uh, programming that we're able to do because of the diverse group that is a part of, of the B-Squad. And then we're, through that program, we're engaging with artists, we're engaging with military veterans. We are engaging with youth who uh, we, we're trying to actually recruit them to do all the outreach that we're being asked to do. And so the, the program uh, was really built with these people who, who came forward and said, can I be a part of this? I want to volunteer. But I can't have any volunteers on my program because of number one, what do we do? We work with stinging insects. And so I need everybody to be an employee so that workers' comp will cover them. Nothing's happened. But it, it's really important uh, to recognize how, just from a responsibility role of how, how we operate, we need to have everybody covered. And, um, and so that's how it grew to 18. So when we think about women, all of our programming, I've, I've given this a lot of thought, we're not at all geared to women. It just happens that the, the people who are directing a lot of it are women. And I also built a program where we're doing science outreach, but I have a few scientists on board, but I also have somebody with their master's in creative nonfiction, somebody with her master's in public health. I have somebody who is in, um, she's got a degree in theater management, and she works 75% B-Squad and 25% in the theater. So, so it's more for my program, not women, but, but um, diversity. And then our audiences are everybody. So we're not, even though it might look like we're discriminating as far as membership, <laughs> we're not, and, and we're really reaching everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. And now we'll hear from Daisy. Good morning. <clears throat> really appreciate you being here because it's Saturday morning and you could be doing so many things here, like having a nice hike, or having a leisurely breakfast with your family, but you chose to be here, which shows your dedication. So I just want to speak um, from my own personal journey of how I came to do this work. As Cinda mentioned, I was an architectural designer and I really should not be doing the kind of work I'm doing because I was on a corporate path. And, but I also want to say that when a young girl is empowered, what she can be capable of as a woman and how she can move mountains and the places that she can go simply because she was empowered in a very young age. So I'll just tell you a little story. So I was about two and a half years old. I was standing in the front lawn of my house in Kashmir, India, very much like the Rockies here, beautiful mountains. And my, uh, I'm standing there because I'd been bullied by another child, and my father comes to me and gives me a pair of boxing gloves, <laughs> literally with laces on them, and it was a full pair of boxing gloves, and he's dangling it in front of me. And uh, he was teaching me how to punch. I was obviously too little. My hands couldn't fit in. And then years later, I asked my dad why he had given me if he had given me the boxing gloves. And he said, yes, I did give you a pair of boxing gloves because you were the third of three daughters and you were being bullied and I wanted you to learn how to stand up for yourself and to defend yourself and if necessary, punch them in the nose. <laughs> well, <laughs> my father was a sportsman and this is the only way that he knew how to empower his daughter. And so with that, I always cherished these gloves, kept them in my room because I knew my father had confidence in me. That's what the gloves were telling me. 
Years later, I came to the United States to pursue an education, and uh, you know, uh, and for some bizarre reason, I wound up marrying an imam, and uh, and uh, his mosque was only uh, 12 blocks from Ground Zero, and um, then in 2010, you heard about the Fuhrer of the community center in Lower Manhattan. You remember that, you recall that? A big story, national story. And uh, you know, the vitriol, the hatred, the disinformation, uh, the misinformation. Uh, I was being portrayed as a woman who's really, you know, hiding behind her loose hair and her fancy clothes. She's so charming, but really she has an alternative agenda, which is to bring Sharia to this country. And all of this stuff was going on. And you know, there were moments when I felt despair. Like, what do I do? I mean, here we were trying to pr uh, create a community center that was going to be a center for all. And it was a center that had a swimming pool, cooking classes, you know, lecture halls. And it wasn't what was being portrayed as a mosque in Ground Zero. And, and our co intentions were being misconstrued. And I was feeling moments of despair, and I remember my father calling me and said, remember the boxing gloves I gave you? This is the biggest fight of your life, and you better fight. And I realized at that time that it wasn't just a fight for me, it was a fight for American values. Because I was fighting for all those other people that would come after me, and so I had to continue to fight. And so, these boxing gloves have been with me at all times. I only carry them physically as a prop for lectures like this. I actually don't <laughs> walk around with them. But they are invisible. And then a few years ago, when we began to hear about ISIS and you know what they were doing and how they were exploiting young girls and how they were recruiting them online, well, my boxing gloves came out again. And I said, it's time to actually fight the big fight. And so, um, as Inda mentioned, uh, this is my new set of boxing gloves, 365 page, because I think that we need to get knowledgeable about information that we don't have because there are so, truth is under attack right now. There's a lot of disinformation in this country and misinformation in this country. So how do you decipher truth from falsehood? And so I decided that I was going to do that and put knowledge and empower people with the knowledge that they need that they're lacking. So there'll be plenty of time to speak about women's rights and the work I'm doing in that in the Q&A, so uh, we'll stop here. Thank you very much. So now we want to give our panelists a chance to kind of ask each other some questions, but before they start, I just want to let you know that in this session, we're going to utilize both the CWA app, if you have that, and a note card system, and we have a couple people handing out the note cards. So to ask a question on the app, you select this section, which is 5102, um, and tap Q&A, and then insert your question, and I'll get it up here. Um, but also, you can write it down on, on a note card, and they will bring it up. And if you're a student or attending remotely, please note this in your questions so we can be sure to call on you. And of course, make your questions legible and brief. So uh, do you guys have any questions you want to ask of each other? You have such diverse I'm gonna, can I start? approaches, please. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start because I, I've been doing a lot of reflection because I was put on the panel. And I'm, I'm curious to both of you, I don't have any programming that is specific for women. We work with kids, but they're, it's just a mixture. Like, is that something that you think anybody working with the community should do? Should, should we specifically have programs that are reaching out to women, or is it okay if we're reaching out to all? Well, I find that when you have to socialize an idea, you usually have to go to women first because they are the glue that holds the family together, the community together, and society together, and they are the low-hanging fruit, and they're usually the most adaptable. I mean, marketers will always tell you that there's the, you know, the early adopters, the, the really people that you can't even reach, and then the people on the fence. So I find that in my work, when I reach out to women, it's usually the first person that responds, and they carry it forward, and they socialize it within the community until it reaches you know, the upper echelon, which is usually the men, and then it gets socialized there. So yeah, women are great. I mean, you're talking about bees. Use the concept of honeybee. I mean, 
<laughs> she, she's a woman, she's a lady, and she's creating this, you know. So, so yeah, I mean, I would reach the women. And I have a, a slightly different take on that. Um, <clears throat> I, I do agree, yeah, it's great to have programs that are specifically arranged for for girls, arranged for trans folks, arranged for you know non-binary identifying people. It's, it's great to have specific programs that are arranged for, for different groups operating in society. But the, the bigger question is, um, when you design the program itself, are you looking at that through a gender lens? How does it impact the different segments of society? And is the goal that you're trying to, to reach with the program going to be met through all those different segments. So if, you know, whatever the program is, how, how is the program going to affect women? How is it going to affect girls? How is it going to affect um, non-binary folks? How is it going to affect trans folks? How is it going to affect um, all of these different parts of the, the population? How is it, and that's, a, it's a slightly different take on it. So then if, if, if the best way to get the positive impact is to do something very specific for that group, then then go that way. But if it's if you know it's a it's a, it's sort of flipping it on the, the other side mm -hmm. um, and looking at what it is you're trying to do with the program in the first place. Cool question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, um, there's lots of things we could say about this, and I, I'm excited because it's this is about you know women and girls who are changing the world, and I think that the diversity of this panel reflects different perspectives and different ways in which we are um, actively seeking to change the world. So I have a question for my colleagues here. Um, if there's one thing that you could change right now, you could go and it would be different, what would it be? No restrictions, just one we thing we could change. Fun. One thing. I'm getting clarification. So my yeah. clarification was no restrictions, just one thing we could change. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go first? No, or? you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. So I, it's, it's just really easy. I really would love it if we were just all nice to each other. And if we are nice to each other, um, a, and a lot of our programming actually is geared towards bringing together people who are on opposite sides of the argument. Believe it or not, in the bee world, you've got commercial beekeepers and backyard beekeepers at odds with each other. You have people who love the native bees uh, who do not like the honeybee people. And you have people who, um, who, who do not like conventional farmers. And, um, and if we all could just, it, and, and then what we found with our programming is that if you bring everybody into the room, it's really hard for them to be mean to each other, but instead they learn from each other. But I think nice is just a, it's a simple word, but it can get us so far. I heard that on another panel yesterday, and that's, I think that's true. I didn't steal it. No, 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 <laughs> no. But I think, I think that's, that's such a, and that's something every single one of us can do. And that's always nice to think about what we can do. Thanks. What are you thinking? Uh, you know, I'm going to take the slightly political view on this one. <clears throat> and usually I'm not political. I'm more in this space. But America is still the most powerful nation in the world. I don't care what anybody says. What we do, what, we do, what happens resonates all over the world. And it has a ripple effect on the entire world. And our leadership is so essential to how we project ourselves and how we communicate with the world and how we get the world to think about things. So I think if there was a leadership change, which we are all capable of doing, I'm not gonna mention any names, if there was a leadership change in this country where we could have the right kind of leader, all these things that we're talking about, giving hope to people, getting rid of meanness, getting rid of hatred, getting rid of bullying, all those things would go away. And we would be a nation, once again, that could actually create it, have a seismic influence on the world, which our influence is dwindling, and I'm really afraid of what's happening to the world as a result of that. And once the world comes apart, we're all individually going to get impacted. So I don't know. We're quite capable of doing that, you know that, with the vote and everything. I'd like to know why 
when women are doing such important work, why our work does not get amplified and taken seriously? And um, in other words, why is it not considered equitable to what men are doing? You are doing such important work in the area of you know, nuclear disarmament. Why do I not know about the work that you're doing and why is it not amplified? Whew, that's like asking why is there a bee cabal in New York City? Because <laughs> I understand that there is um, and that there's, it's like mean girls around beekeeping in, in New York. Uh, I, no, I've, he I've heard this random. Um, I'm so glad we <laughs> met. Um, <laughs> but it, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. If you look at who, who gets the space to talk about issues. Like, working on nuclear weapons is considered a hard security issue. It's an issue that, when I first started doing this, they're like, why are you doing this? You're working for a women's organization. This, this isn't a women's issue. Yeah. Yeah. I said, no, this is an issue that affects women. This is an issue that, that we have every right to be here. I remember going to, having a, a discussion with an ambassador one day who said, who was introducing me to somebody, said, oh, this is Susie. She's with the Women's International League on Peace and Freedom. She doesn't come to talk to me about human rights and those women's issues. She comes to talk to me about why we haven't signed the Chemical Weapons Convention. I was like, yeah, that's exactly right, because that's an issue that affects women. Um, and I think that there's this, again, it's a, a cultural space where there's an assumption that there's boxes, and we should only be speaking about what's in our box. Um, and, yeah, sorry. Uh, in, and in your, it, stay in your lane, basically. Yes, to stay in our lane, and that's actually, that's ridiculous, because these issues, all issues affect all of us, um, and we have every right to do so. But when you look at the representation, uh, a colleague did a study on how many women are, sp are participating in delegations of governments talking about nuclear weapons. How many women are ahead of delegations? And it's about, it went from being about 11% to now being about 17%. Um, and that's of 190 countries. 17% have women as head of delegation, and that's really pathetic. Um, and it comes back again to this issue of where is the representation? When you have equal representation, then it's not an issue that is solely you know, a women's issue, it's an issue that affects women. And I think, um, I'm curious to, to hear if folks wanna talk about what their opinions are around quotas. And this move, there's a, a Scandinavian move that requires uh, the boards of directors for, for companies to have um, at least 40% women represented on their board of directors. Um, and that's changing the economic discussion. Um, it's changing things. And I'm curious how, how people feel about that. I, I go back and forth on the quota question all the time, but I have seen directly the impact of more women being represented means that women are taken more seriously and are heard. And as to why you haven't heard about the, the work we're doing on nuclear weapons, we live in the U.S. and the stuff that's in the media on nuclear weapons is not about American nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's not reflecting the fact that the United States has the second largest arsenal in the world and there's one dude, one man, <laughs> who has the power, the sole unchecked authority to launch a nuclear weapon at any time. One guy in the world, nine countries have them, eight men and one woman have the ability to do this. And that's not something that gets talked about in the nuclear armed countries as much as it should. <clears throat> Good question. Wow. Yeah, sorry. No. That was maybe heavy for Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. Do I have to follow that? <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, I live in a bubble. Okay. Um, again, I'm coming from this, this my world, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a science world. It's a, it's a Minnesota world. Any Minnesotans in the audience? <laughs> It's a good place oh, to there? be, I think, right? I mean, I, 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 have, I have led a very charmed life as far as being a woman. Um, and, and so while I'm, I, I don't at all disagree with the numbers, and I, I, and I totally understand that they were underrepresented, um, I can give you so many examples of really good interactions I've had. And, and wh when you asked the question, I was, I was thinking about it and one of like one of the some of, some of it is that 
like getting together and having those conversations. So a lot of the commercial beekeeping industry is, is led by men. It's a generational family organization. And these men are, are um, hardworking, love bees, good at what they do. They defer to a group of women scientists like crazy. And they respect, can I swear? It's not even swearing. They respect the hell out of us. And, and it is, well, it, okay, but. <laughs> Okay, I'm, that's where I'm going to stop, though. <laughs> they, they <laughs> it's a heck of a good word. No, they, they really do respect us. And, and so, so it's a lot of it, I think, is, is getting people together in the room because these, the, the, uh, the other thing is that a lot of these men, their relationship with their wives, it's a very different relationship than I have with my husband. And they, they do sometimes follow very traditional roles that you know I, I would not be comfortable in. But at the same time, the men are able to go here with the, the women that they work with at the University of Minnesota, and then they have the relationship here. And, and I don't get the sense that they disrespect their wives. They just, they have this different agreement. And so it's, for, for me, again, it's a very, um, Situational and, and and I feel like you are here and I am way down here with this example, <laughs> but but that's my that's kind of where that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Well, we are getting some <laughs> wonderful questions coming in, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'd like to start off with with one question for the panel. Um, you know, given all these things that we do know that that women are changing the world and are making a difference, and, and the evidence keeps coming in on, you know, if women are on the boards of companies, they are more profitable, they did better in the downturn. So we have this evidence, but um, still it's not happening, as Daisy pointed out. And one of the reasons is funding. Um, you know, from the foundations, the, the percent of money that goes to women is, I forget, under 10%, I think. Um, what, what is it that <coughs> we need to do in order to, to get that funding to do the work? You know, the, the women's movement began, you know, it took 70 years before women got the right to vote, and it didn't happen until it was a male philanthropist that stood up and began funding the movement. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm what we need to do, how we get more money? I have two things on this, because I think this is really important, to be able to have the money to do the work that we're trying to do is, is amazing. To be able to have a job, to do what you're passionate about, to change, to create change, and have a job in that takes money. And it's not money that I, I brought to the game. <laughs> Um, and I think looking at this, I think there's, there's two kind of things that we should, we should look at. One is to kind of change how philanthropy works to make it, right now it's often very transactional. Uh, we will give you this amount of money to produce this, this product, this research, or this political result, or this issue. It's, it's transactional. And to change that, and I think it is starting to change to a more relational, we'll work together to create this change that we want to see. We trust that you'll be able to deliver, even if it's not the exact outputs that you put in the log frame in your grant proposal. We know that you'll deliver on the change. And that's changing things from a very specific transactional relationship to a, a more relational one. And the second one is to stop with the project funding and go straight on to core funding. And that will change everything. When you have unrestricted funds, to be able to sit back and think for a hot second and what is actually going to be going on to evaluate what we did, where it worked, and what lessons do we take forward. Core funding is going to make a huge difference. Oh, and everyone can give a little bit. So find an organization that you like, skip a, skip a Starbucks, and give a bit. It makes a huge difference. Everyone can do that. I can't believe I have to follow her again. <laughs> yeah. No, I, this is awesome, <laughs> this is awesome. So I, I think that's, I, I, 
okay, everybody's going to move to Minnesota now because I'm thinking about our B-Lab donors and so many of them are women. <laughs> and so so it's, it's kind of uh, interesting. But I, I will say that when we are looking for funding to do projects, I just have to reiterate that you it is very project-based. And w a lot of times we're expected to come up with that um, that uh, the funding to, to just support who we are. And that that is a burden on what we do. Of the, the 18 um, people who belong in the B-Squad, the only actual hard money is 50% of my position. The rest of the money is literally um, customer-generated revenue. It is um, it's donations and it's grants that we write to get funding to build, to piece meal our, our work together. So we're working hard to, s to keep going forward because we have, I think, six people who are in full-time positions. I, th I will say the, the one more thing about the money, and we were talking about this last night, which is, which is that I've noticed that in our structure, if a woman has a baby, it, at least at my university, the, um, it goes from full-time to part-time, um, it turns out that and, and it could happen for a man also, but if, if you go down to, to part-time, you actually lose some of your rights to supervise people, and you lose, I see people nodding, you lose uh, rights. Actually, I had to fight to have uh, an employee have a, a purchasing card, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, 10 hours a week is not going to influence her actual ability to make a purchasing decision. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I recognize that structure, and it's kind of the next level internally for our program where I want my team members to be able to have kids and then come back. And I'm guessing, and we've got men in this audience, I'm guessing that it would be lovely if, if it was all equal. If, uh, and I know that some countries have moved towards that, but if the child rearing responsibilities and benefits were totally shared and that there were no penalties for those. So a little off, but, but I think it's, it's something that we can all work on. Excellent. So this is such an important issue because without resources you really can't do anything, right? So I think that I wish that uh, philanthropists would look at individuals who are doing this kind of work as entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur with an idea, you know, I mean, there's <clears throat> all this seed money that is being given to individuals who have a brilliant for-profit idea. But a nonprofit ideas are equally important because they are for the good of society, and that eventually impacts all of us. If we have peaceful societies, the peace dividend is so huge when we have peaceful societies. Societies flourish. Arts flourish, everything, culture flourishes, everything flourishes. So why can't we look at this issue from a point of view of the societal good? So I think all the ways that you know, traditional philanthropists have been funding this stuff about programmatic thing only. I mean, I have philanthropists that say to me that are women philanthropists who understand the work I'm doing saying, I know you need money for rent, so I'll pay for your rent for the next two years. Do you know how freeing that is for me? Do you know how easy that is for me to know that my lights can be switched, that I can have a desk, that I can have people who can come and sit here. I have file cabinets where I can file things. And I don't have to worry about that because these capacity building grants are not given by foundations. I really don't know what's happened, but they only want to fund programs. And how do you fund programs if you don't have a staff, if you don't have a person, if you don't have lights and you don't have, how do you do that? So that's what I'm saying. They, you need to incubate ideas, and you need to pay for that idea, and you need to then stay with those people and help them make that idea better. Jeff Bezos, when he started his Amazon, he had mentors. I'm happy to take a mentor on. Any business person who wants to come on board and be my mentor, I'll be delighted because they know they're going to add value. And that's exactly what happened with Wise Up. This was just an idea. It's a crazy idea to bring 72 people together to publish such a book. And people thought it was insane. I said, no, it has to be done because we're women. We have to do something holistically, and we have to look at this issue from different perspectives. So I had two bankers who decided that they were going to be my mentors. And they helped you know, bring other people um, to, the, to, the, to, to the table. So we were able to cobble together you know, small seed funding from here and there, and literally with a shoestring budget, we were able to publish this because there was a passion, there was a commitment to the idea, and, and, the, and, and there was a fire in the belly because we needed to fix the problem. 
And you know, now we're poised to, to go out there and help with white supremacy because we already have studied extremism in general and now we can apply these same things to white supremacy and stop that. So, but once again, it was just an idea and some people came forward and recognized the idea and ideas need to be funded and they need to be taken seriously and they need to be helped and aided and I think that this is the shift that needs to take place. But there are individuals who understand that and they're usually private family foundations, smaller funding, but they exist and I just wish that more bigger philanthropists would recognize the importance of doing the same way. So Daisy, one of the questions that came in was how to obtain Wise Up, but before you answer that, also our first question from a student is regarding your comment regarding it was a fight for American values. So this is a question to all the speakers. How do you think American values shape the discrimination that women face? Mm. Daisy, tell them how to get tell the book get the while book. we're thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll answer this question. So I have a few copies with me today, so we can obtain it here. It's uh, $30. Uh, online, you can obtain it from wisemuslimwomen.org. You can take a picture of this later if you want, and uh, online, it's $35. Uh, it's not available on Amazon, because Amazon takes 40% of this, and we would lose all the money because it's a self-published book. So um, we have to speak to Jeff about that, if anybody knows Jeff. Uh, there should be a discount for nonprofit publications on Amazon. There's no reason why they should be charging 40, 50% of, you know, for nonprofits. So, um, um, but I mean, this other question I'm still thinking, anybody else wanna go first? It's such a heavy question. So I know, I know not to get the book from Amazon. I know <laughs> to get it from your website. And how do American values um, shape this shape this, this relation with, with women? This is, a, this is a great question, and it's very difficult because you've got us all stumped and we're all talkers. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a, a couple of things. On my way into this country, I, when I'm on airplanes, I watch movies. And I, um, I watched the, the film On the Basis of Sex, which if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it because I thought it was fantastic. And that, that film, and it's about you know the notorious RBG. Uh, <laughs> some people will laugh at that one. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, anyway, it's about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and how she kind of got her, her start in, in law. And she had a professor when she was attending one of her husband's classes um, that said, law, here's the thing with law. Law doesn't react to weather. Law reacts to climate. And every so often, there are significant societal shifts that require significant changes in law. Law, um, for years, law helped with the subjugation of women in, in the United States and around the world, and continues to in a lot of, a lot of countries. And that law has changed. And I think that's where, where I would go is that this, this concept, law comes from what the society sees as our, our values as a whole, right? It's a reflection of that. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, but in this instance, it's, there is opportunity for, for law, equal rights, equal rights laws to change in order to reflect that our society must be more equitable. And I think there, there is some, some opportunity there. Um, the, the values that we project as Americans uh, are changing as well. And I think that that's important. And that's because of conversations and really difficult conversations that we have with our friends, with our family, with our community. You know, it's, it's because we reach out and we ask the questions, how does this affect women, how does this affect trans people, how does this affect people of color, where are those people in the conversation? Because we're doing that, we can change the value system. And I think that it is very possible um, if we reach out and have those, those conversations. And the values that currently exist, some things are not always great, and some things are. There is a, a, a value that you know we all have rights, 
no matter what our background is. And that has changed and we can keep changing it. Back to my brilliant co-panelists. Co okay. I, I, after the election in 2016, I had in the B-Squad office a bunch of people who were crying, okay? We didn't get a lot of work done that day. I was not crying. I was saying <coughs> that we need to figure out and look for what's next that's going to be positive because there if it hadn't happened, I think it wouldn't have opened my eyes to the fact of how split our country is and how, s how there are so many people out there who do not think like me. Now, I've said this already. We really do live in li a little bit of a bubble in Minnesota. And um, I can't, I'm hoping somebody's read the book, but there's a Barbara Kingsolver book about the monarchs in Appalachia. Anybody know the name? Okay, um, I, I, I turned my phone off, so I can't Google it. But it, it talked about how, um, how a, a pardon? It, it talked about how um, a, a bunch of academics went to help the monarchs and, and they went to this community and they started teaching them how to recycle and how to be environmentalists. And the truth was that the, they were already living that way and they literally didn't have the money to live any other way. And so going to the thrift store wasn't trendy, going to the thrift store was how they got clothes. And, and it was, for me, living in my, my lovely academia bubble, I was able to, to see that the way I looked at the world was, was very, very different. And so when we talk about bringing it to American values and, and how, how our American values can change, I think that when big things happen, we need to look at the fact that we are all so diverse and we have, there are people who, who think so differently than us. And I'm not saying us in the room, I'm saying just from, from whoever your cohort is in your belief system, that the true American values is figuring out how you are going to get along with that group. And it feels like since the election, we've made a lot of progress in, in local governments stepping up or local organizations stepping up. I know there was a lot of fear about science funding maybe stopping, um, but because of, of just the governmental regulations changing. And, and we haven't seen an issue with funding for what we're doing. Um, in fact, we've kind of seen some more support coming our way. And I, I think that when you look at American values and, and you go to women, you, you I, I have a hard time just saying women because again, it goes to the point where, and, and I'm actually <laughs> having a hard time saying men versus women because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of people aren't identifying as a, as a woman or a man, but they're just identifying as a person who has beliefs, who wants to accomplish different things and wants to do it with the freedom that American values usually al allows a lot of us to pursue and achieve. So uh, sorry if I complicated everything, but, but I think that um, I think America has changed so much. And when I look back historically, we've done some really bad things. And, and I think that I have a hard time holding on to American history and American values, but I, I only hope that going forward, we're gonna keep it getting better. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, except for, thank you so much. It's called Flight Behavior, Barbara Kingsolver, and it was, it's one of those books that actually really changed my life. So I recommend you go for it after you buy. <laughs> so, um, oftentimes when I've done public speaking on Muslim women issues, I always get the question, why are Muslim women oppressed and suppressed in all over the world? And then I usually respond with, that's true, there are women who are oppressed and suppressed, but we've had 10 women heads of state. <laughs> and these are Muslim majority countries, and these are Muslim men th that are voting these women in. So there is such a disparity with what's happening in America where we have gone to Afghanistan to fight for women's rights, 
right? That was a stated policy to free women from their oppression, but yet we can't seem to get a woman in office. <laughs> And so the world looks at us and says, what is going on in America? Why can't America, why is it not acceptable to have a woman as a head of state in America? What is preventing America from living up to its own ideals, the ideals that it seems seemingly promoting everywhere all over the world, right? Women's rights, every woman has a right, and you know, it's literally something that, it's th there's, there's a disconnect between the two, and I see, two major trends emerging in the world right now at the same time and I think we need to we need to jump on that trend because we can actually be part of that trend so one trend is the rise of extremism all over the world and that's a separate topic but and I can tell you why that is and then at the same time women running for office everywhere and I don't think it's an accident I really think that this trend is a negative trend, it's a destructive trend, it's an evil trend, it's a hateful trend, it has all the things that are, you know, about to destroy, uh, the, you know, they're, they're on a path of destruction. And this other trend is the nurturer, the, the merciful, the, um, the empathy, uh, the convener, the collaborator, all the values that the, the, the really uh, wonderful values that women bring to the table. It's not a gender issue. It's, a, it's we complement men in so many ways because we have you know, eyeballs in the back of our head. I mean, we just, this is just how we were, this is, you know, we're multitaskers, we are resourceful, we're collaborators. That's what the world needs right now. And if you, you saw an example of that with Jacinda in New Zealand, and what she did and how quickly she responded and how she found all the resources and how she collaborated and how she used her skill, her core women's skill to the table for the benefit of her society. That's what the world needs right now. And if we do that in America and if we're able to vote somebody in that can be that kind of an exemplar, a leader, I think that we can uh, restore our American core values and people will look up to us again. Thank you. So Rebecca, a couple questions for you. I'll just kind of combine. I hope they're uh, about bees. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's in your expertise. <laughs> so as a female in a male-dominated STEM field, what um, advice do you have for empowering myself to make a change? But then also, we have someone who wants you to tell us um, more why we desperately need bees to survive today. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think sometimes people feel sorry for me on these panels where I feel out of my element. Okay, I, I'm gonna address the, the woman in the STEM field. We all have to be strong. We, men and women have to be strong and have to know what their boundaries are and have to figure out how to tell people what your boundaries are. And so it's really, I'm answering to the woman who asked the question and to the, to the men who might be asking the question. I, th I think that in order, it, it, it's amazing, and I, I'll, I'll say this, but you ask for what you want, and so many times you get there. And, and I've always lived my life where there's always a, like a one year, two year, three, five year plan. And you put it down in writing, and then you start telling people this is what you want to do. Oh my gosh, that's how things happen. And so, I have a again a harder harder time looking at it as a male female, but more of a who are you? What are you bringing to the table? And then don't be afraid to tell people that what you want to do is X Y Z because. People who are in, I know people at this table, we're connectors. So if somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I really want to study bees, then I know people who might be looking for graduate students. I know people who, who might, um, or, or good first steps. And so, and I'm guessing that I've got people around me who would also be really happy to mentor you. And um, so that I guess that's another thing, find a mentor too, find somebody to help you because that's what people do. Once people have gotten to a level that they are in their field and enjoying it, one of the, the biggest, uh, most satisfying feelings is helping somebody else get there. And so that's one. Um, was there a bee question in there? What's yeah, going on with the bees? Why do we need yeah. bees to survive? Why do we need bees to survive? Um, I've said this before, so I, I could live on bread forever and that's about it, but I'm guessing some of you like 
almonds and fruits and vegetables and all those kinds of things. They're pretty healthy. Um, our, our bees are in the United States uh, contribute to $20 billion to the food industry. Uh, they provide pollination services, and those pollination services, in all seriousness, help us access food at prices that we can afford. Now, we can always get better, we can always have cheaper food, there are always improvements, but the reason that we need our bees, uh, the reason that we need our honeybees, our native bees are, are amazing pollinators, they're absolutely fantastic, they're actually better than honeybees, but our honeybee industry, you put honeybees in a box, you can truck 30,000 of them from place to place, and, and the truth is we still need pesticides in order to ensure food safety, and our, our honeybees, you can, offload them from the truck, they can do their job, you put them back on the truck, and then the farmers can spray what they need to spray in order to have a harvest. And so um, bees are really important to that, that connection, unless you're like me, I just love bees because they are fascinating, absolutely <laughs> fascinating. That's how I fell in love with them, because I really don't like fruits or vegetables. <laughs> Okay, oh, but you should eat the fruits and vegetables because it's really good for you. <laughs> they are really good for you. So we have a, a couple similar questions here, which I think is important. Um, I would suggest that empowering women must include the engagement of men and the teaching of boys how to acknowledge their feminine side and develop it in concert with the women in their lives, as we do with our children and grandchildren. And also that gender equality is something we should all be invested in. How do we engage the boys, men, and other folks so that they take a more active role in promoting gender equality? And so before I turn it over to the panelists, I do want to say that at OurSecureFuture.org, we have um, initiated a uh, program called Male Allies for Women, Peace, and Security, started by Ambassador Don Steinberg. Um, it launched just a couple weeks ago in Washington and New York. Um, and it, it includes a policy brief of exactly what men can do. So. so important because the work I did in Afghanistan, I recognized that I could not do without the male leaders there because they were highly influential, especially the imams. So um, I partnered with a woman in Afghanistan who was, you know, had her own NGO and provided her with all the um, opinion papers that she needed to promote women's rights. So things of child marriage, you know, uh, lack of education, the kind uh, social mobility, uh, movement of women, the kinds of things that really were affecting women in Afghanistan. So the way we did this was um, we identified one male uh, imam who was a little bit progressive than the rest, and we asked him to give us advice on how to reach those that were super conservative or were not reachable. So he actually provided us with insight on how to get to these people. And then uh, once we knew how to do that, what the approach was, we actually brought 20 of them together. Not just one, because when you just work with one, then that person is in isolation, and then they have to convince others. So we brought the 20 together in a workshop setting and then we presented this information to all 20 at the same time, and we asked them simply to just read it and tell us what they think about it. Well, our research was so compelling, it was done so well, it was so grounded, it was so authoritative that it was really hard for them to, to deny that. And, and you know, they transformed so quickly, and so much so that you know, one imam went to conduct a wedding, and there was a young girl sitting there, she was 13, she was crying, and he said, why are you crying? She said, well, I don't want to get married. He said, well, she doesn't want to get married. It's against, you know, because we had done this thing that, you know, consent is a necessary part of the Islamic marriage, period. If the girl doesn't consent, it's not legit. So he said, well, she hasn't consented. And of course, it, there was a wedding party already. Both families tried to bribe him because he refused to conduct the marriage. He left, and uh, he did not conduct the marriage. And he said, oh, by the way, if another imam conducts this marriage, let me know which one it is. Because guess what? We had brought the 20 imams from the neighborhood because they had all received the same training so they, so they would be able to identify who that one person is. And so the next day he gave a sermon in his mosque and he basically you know, told the audience, why are we doing this to our daughters? This is not allowed. Why are we ruining their lives? And there was a little old man sitting in the corner there and he was so shaken up, he went to the imam and shook him by the collar and said, why weren't you telling us this before? 
I have ruined the lives of my three daughters because I forcibly married them. And they're all unhappy and their lives are ruined. And then the imam looked at him and said, it's too late for you, but it's not late for everybody else in the room. So male allies are essential to certain societies where you know men have a lot of influence. And we need them as allies and we need them as our advocates and, uh, you know, and our partners. And, and I think that's the best way to get social change happening and, uh, and uh, you know, working with them. So Daisy, actually, one of the questions that had come in, which you've answered partly, but maybe to address the larger one, and the question was, why are imams not more involved in, um, in speak why are they silent in the face of the ISIS violence? So that's actually a misnomer. They have condemned. So the problem with Islam is that you don't have a central authority, so you don't hear the big voice. So we are decentralized religion. Every, every leader is a leader for his own community, for his own mosque. We don't have a central authority. There's no hierarchy in Islam, except maybe in Shia Islam there's hierarchy. But that's only 10% of, of the world, 1.8 billion people. So um, the difficulty is how do you bring all of them together? So in our book, we actually have a section on why don't Muslims speak out. So for me, this is a speaking out. But we actually collected 1,400 condemnations. And you can go on our website, and you can download the Excel spreadsheet. Because we wanted to empower people with this information. People think we aren't speaking out. There have been countless fatwas issued condemning ISIS. But usually, it does not get reported in the press. So I'll give you an example. When 9-11 happened, and Al-Qaeda attacked you know, New York and Pentagon, and um, my husband invited, um, you know, um, the, uh, the U.S. military had to go to Afghanistan, and there were some members of the Muslim military. And so they wanted to know if they should go fight fellow Muslims. Like, is it, am I allowed as a Muslim to fight a fellow Muslim? And there was a fatwa issued, a fatwa is a legal opinion, a fatwa issued by seven major scholars literally a week after 9-11 saying that 9-11 was a terrorist attack, and as an American, as an American Muslim, you have the right to defend your nation. So yes, you can go to Afghanistan and fight your enemy. It was a major fatwa. It never made it to the press. So what is Americans to think? They think Muslims are quiet, they're not saying anything, and this was a major fatwa issued by major jurors in the world, and that would have shaped the perception completely cha changed the narrative because now you would have known that this was really an act of terror and the Muslims were against it and you know Muslims would have been empowered to do more but the whole thing was it got overshadowed, it got underplayed, it got pushed to the side in C5 section of New York Times, like <coughs> a little, little thing like this. This is the problem. The problem is the press doesn't report it and so the, the, the public is left with the impression that Muslims aren't doing anything. I mean, I have personal experience with this. We don't have enough time to go into this. I've done so many events where the press have come, they've taken photographs, the reporter has been spent, and the next day there's nothing in the press. And I'm like, why? Why don't you want Americans to know what is going on here? But I think it's changing now, but I still think that they only promote what bleeds leads. That's all they're interested in showing, the death, the destruction, the theatrics, and they don't show who's doing what. So for instance, when you know, we published this book, we had a summit, 350 people were in the room, everybody from government was there, and the press said, well, we're too busy with Donald Trump, we're doing political reporting right now. I said, well, I don't know, if this is not political, then I don't know what is political, you know? So, um, so the issue is, press has to make a, make a decision whether they are going to change the narrative or not. You know, I, I, I solely blame, blame the press on this one, and I tell people in the, in the press that they have a responsibility. Okay, we have five minutes left and so many more questions. This is such a great conversation. So I'm gonna kind of lump them all together. Um, I wanna start with Susie here because one of the questions was when uh, will the report on Ban the Bomb be done and how is it available? But um, the things I'd like you to each consider as you talk is how do we make this not just about white women but to be sure to involve more women of color and then in particular, indigenous women and in women who are part of the internally displaced population in areas of conflict. What can they do? How can we strength, help strengthen their role? Um, what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? And the last question is, what is the most powerful change that you've seen in the last 10 years? In under two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Okay, Susie. so the report on the um, on the companies involved in making nuclear weapons you can find on don'tbankonthebomb.com. Don'tbankonthebomb.com. I would tell my 18-year-old self, stay strong, stay bold, and be fearless. I was pretty fearless already when I was 18. I, kinda, I need to tell my <coughs> not 18-year-old self to be that fearless, uh, co to continue being that fearless. Um, and I wanted to just... Briefly, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip one of these, but go back to that question of the engagement of men for a second. And I want people to know the UN, UN Women, which is a, a, a UN entity, has this great program they launched a couple of years ago called He for She. Um, and it's about how to work, you know, as all members of society to balance out, um, balance out the power in the world. And it's getting to gender equity is going to be hard. Sharing power is hard. Those who have power don't like to give it up. Um, and we see this, and it's, it's for all of us to recognize, you know, there's a, there's a great book out there called Shrill um, that talks about the, the modulation of women's voices and why that makes it difficult sometimes for women to, to be seen as powerful women. But nothing happens in isolation. And masculinity is not, by definition, toxic. Brave men stand up for women. That is a cool thing about what men can do, and I wanted to, to just remind and to applaud our allies in this, because we're not alone. Let's let the others get Thank you. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to answer one of those, because my 18-year-old self, we don't want to go there. Um, I, when we do programming at the University of Minnesota, when we have events, we actually have a really diverse group, and we, we do our programming <coughs> to very diverse groups, but every once in a while, we'll have a, a big event and we'll go, uh oh, you know, how, you know, could we have gotten more white people at this event? <laughs> Is it, and so we, we recognize and then reevaluate. And so we actually have a group of, of three Latino women who uh, work with us and, um, and are trained to do <coughs> outreach in Spanish. And we, we also will, will say, okay, how do we reach out to your communities? And so we are actively evaluating our audiences and trying to do better. And if we, if we have a miss, then the next year when we do that, uh, that event, we say, okay, do we give free tickets out to this group? Or how do, how do we get more diversity because it is it is interesting how we do end up with a lot of um, and, and I have nothing against white people so I'm not discriminating but we, we will end up with very um, monoculture uh, audiences and so we actively work against that Daisy would you close this out in one minute Thanks. yes <laughs> So if I was uh, talking about my 18 year old self first of all I would have asked myself why am I here and what am I supposed to do and how do I do it and how do I discover the power that is within me and which wound up being my wings, how do I develop my own wings so I can go to places that I never imagined I can go to and also never leave without your boxing gloves. So that is what I would have told my 18 year old self. Um, as far as um, what is the change that I have seen, I have seen in the last two years a remarkable shift here in the United States and globally Hate is on the rise, decency is on the decline, and truth is completely under attack. And we, as a nation of the free, are living in fear. And I am hopeful that we can all turn that around and shift that tide and give hope to people and, and change and, and shift this and, and go back to being decent human beings and living up to our human ideals. Okay, thank you all for coming. <laughs>